Has sexual trauma impacted your life or your marriage? Speaking with Kenzie Dzinski is like drinking from a deep well of wisdom, peace, and grace. In today's conversation, we talk about steps to heal yourself and your marriage from sexual trauma. My heart breaks for the many couples walking the road of sexual brokenness together. I know it isn't easy, but hope is real and Kenzie gently shares it with us today. I realize this is a longer episode than usual, but I just couldn't cut much from this conversation. So if you need to, listen to half of it at a time, because you don't want to miss any of it. This is episode 28. Hi friend, you're listening to Find Hope Here. I'm your host, Teresa Whiting, author, speaker, ministry leader, friend, and fellow struggler. This is a podcast about the messy, complicated, painful parts of life, but also the beautiful, joy-filled hope that Jesus promises. Each week, we dig deep into God's Word together and talk about how His truth impacts our everyday lives. I'm not going to ask you to sit with me and have coffee because I seem to have my best conversations while I'm just doing life. So I'd love to hang out with you as you walk or fold laundry or drive to work. You're invited to join me in pursuing the hope God promises. No matter where you are or where you've been, I pray you always find hope here. Let's jump in to today's episode. All right, so I am super excited to introduce my dear friend, Kenzie Dzinski. We actually just met for the first time over Zoom, but we've kind of been corresponding for a couple of years. And so um, let me tell you a little bit about Kenzie. She is a Kentucky licensed marriage and family therapist. She's a certified professional coach and relationship educator in private practice. And she holds a bachelor's in psychology and a master's in marriage and family counseling from Asbury Theological Seminary. In 2015, Kenzie opened a therapy and coaching practice that focuses specifically on individual and relational growth within the marriage relationship. She's the host of the Brave Marriage podcast, where you can find over 150 episodes of short, faith-based, research-informed teachings on individual and marital growth. And um, that's what she has in her bio, but I'm going to add to that also. Um, I have listened to Kenzie's podcast And what I have absolutely loved about it is that she speaks with truth and conviction and honesty about um, the realities and the complexities of marriage, but she comes at it with such a heart of compassion and tenderness that I feel like her podcast is so life-giving. So if you haven't listened to Brave Marriage, I really encourage you to go over there and give it a listen and subscribe and a five-star rating and review. But um, I just wanted to put my two cents in that I think her podcast is one of my favorites. It's just such, it's so life-giving for marriages and for women. Um, Also, for the past year, she's been working on a memoir about marriage, counseling, gender roles, and the roles we play in bettering people's lives within the church. And today she coaches individual women and couples online, helping them discover mutuality, identity, and intimacy in marriage. So Kenzie, thank you so much. I'm just so honored that you're on my podcast and I'm excited for our conversation. So why don't you tell the listeners a little bit more about you um, outside of the formal bio? Sure. Well, Teresa, thank you so much for having me. This is very fun. And that was such a kind introduction. Um, A little bit more about me and my story. I'll tell you what I do, a little bit about my background. Those are kind of woven together. So I grew up uh, the oldest of four girls. I grew up in the church. Um, My parents were very young when they got married, had us four when they were very young, so they they struggled in their early mm-hmm. marriage and uh, struggled for about 10 years until they went to marriage counseling. So I always say that my parents' marriage was saved by the grace of God and a good marriage counselor, a good Christian marriage counselor. And so I really mm-hmm. reaped the benefits of 
watching my parents do their work and seeing that transformation in their lives and then getting to grow up witnessing the fruit of that in the second half of my childhood. And so I feel like that was a pretty unique experience that me and my sisters who are all married still have today, just reaping those generational benefits from their Mm. work. And um, that was all happening unbeknownst to me, actually, uh, when I felt called to become a marriage counselor. So growing up, I knew that I enjoyed listening. I enjoyed observing things. I knew that I wanted to go into ministry in some way. And then I had a few friends, you know, along the way who would say, I think you would make a good counselor. And so I ended up going to school. Like you said, I have a degree in psychology. I um, have a master's in marriage and family counseling and did those things to pursue licensure. Fast forward to uh, 2015 And I opened a private practice focusing on relationships. Mm -hmm. And then about two to three weeks into opening my private practice. So meanwhile, my husband, Evan, and I were trying to start a family. Mm -hmm. Two to three weeks in, I had what's called an ectopic pregnancy, Mm -hmm. which for listeners who don't know what that is, it's where a pregnancy occurs outside of the womb often in the fallopian tube, which was my case. So I found myself in the hospital for a couple of nights recovering from that and from surgery. And uh, through the next year, Evan and I were exploring different options and found out that essentially we wouldn't be able to have biological children without the help of artificial reproductive technology. Mm -hmm. And just for our family after praying through it, that wasn't going to be the right fit for us. So, so we are a family of two, Evan and I, we've been married 11 years and we're figuring out every day what it looks like for it to just be the two of us. But I share that because through that experience, I think the Lord did a lot of formational work in our lives. Mm. Because I really had to evaluate, um, you know, where do I find meaning now that I've planned my whole life, you know, to become a marriage and family therapist, to have a family. And so he just, while I wouldn't wish that experience on anyone, he really used it to form me in a lot of ways to show Mm -hmm. me where I had some idols that I was holding on to more tightly than him. So. Wow. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. I love that. And I love how, um, you know, that's a difficult that's a difficult thing to walk through and you've let God use that to form you and to shape you. And, and you can use that in the lives of the people that you're serving now. And so that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I like that you said too, that you're, you're figuring it out every day. Cause I feel like we're all <laughs> Greg and I have been married almost 30 years and I feel like we're still figuring it out. <laughs> <laughs> that's so comforting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what you do, um, you know, as a coach, as a therapist. And also, um, for those who don't know, I asked Kenzie, I have so much respect for her and just for her view of women and marriage. And I had asked her to read through Graced before it was published and to potentially write an endorsement. And she kindly did. And so I also want to get her perspective on women and Jesus and scripture and how these women fit into the world and into our lives. And, you know, the people that she has seen in her practice, the people that she knows, you know, how, how does the stories of these women in scripture relate to people in real life? That's kind of what I want to talk about today. So I had a question for you, um, about women in today's culture, um, that feel marginalized because I, when we um, talked about grace, you were, you were mentioning that it's not just the sexually broken women, but these are women that were marginalized in that society. So, so let's talk about that today. Like, how do you see women marginalized? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I think a lot of women feel marginalized in, in various ways and, and it depends on which, you know, which culture you're talking about. You know, I think of my my sponsor children in in Uganda and Haiti and um, their context and their um, their opportunity for education, their 
their governments, their economies, all the different things and the layers that are impacting them Mm. and their ability to have opportunity. And so I I just, I often wonder how they are experiencing marginalization in their context or how their moms are experiencing that. Um, So I think that, you know, it does depend on your culture, but anywhere you go, um, you know, you're looking at race, you're looking at governmental systems, you're looking at economies, you're looking at gender, educational opportunities, and and really how does um, how does the culture in which you live uh, look at those layers of who you are? So does it does it prize you or does mm. it diminish you? Does it value you or does it overlook you? And so then I think we can hone in and look at women in the church and how they sometimes feel marginalized. You know, before um, before the story that I just shared with you, I, you know, come from a two-parent household, middle-class family. And when you come from that, you often don't think about those on the outskirts of that. Not everyone has the traditional nuclear family. And I think there are just a lot of families, you know, especially because when your when your family is intact, when you have resources, when you're able bodied, um, the church I think can unintentionally value you or focus on you mm. um, because you're able to be involved, right? You're able to help. You're able to have time to do those things and to get involved in the church. Um, but since my experience, I've often looked at, okay, where's the widow? Where is the, the single? Where is the disabled person? And how is the church serving them in ways where they are not feeling marginalized, but they're feeling included in the body of Christ, just like everyone else? Mm. That kind of leads right into the next um, thing I wanted to talk about, because we see that in Jesus. We see him being so inclusive and drawing in the people that were on the outside. He, That was his heart. He just always reached out to the ones that, that the religious people were pushing away. Mm-hmm. So how do his interactions with women provide um, direction for us? As, how can he guide us as a church? Let's talk about that. Yeah. Well, I think if I think if all of us look to Jesus model for how he treated men and women, we <laughs> we would be in a much healthier place mm-hmm. as a church. But you know, it, particularly in his interactions with women, I just watch Jesus over and over restore women's dignity in a culture where it's more patriarchal where women can be outcast or ostracized or considered impure or unclean. He restores their dignity. He, he looks them in the eye, you know, he speaks to them. He allows them to touch him without shunning them. You know, there's just so much dignity and respect that he has for women and, and not just like lifting them up, but then also empowering them or, or treating them as he would any other disciple where Mm -hmm. he's saying, you know, go and sin no more, go and tell others about me. And so I think we could just learn a lot from Jesus. If we would just read his stories and look at the patterns of how he treats women and go, Oh, you know, in the church, in what ways are we forgetting to lift up women or to see them as just as valuable as, as men in ministry roles, that Mm -hmm. sort of thing. I think there's a lot we could learn. Yeah. Yeah. I think so many women, um, and even especially, I think the ones who maybe are marginalized and the ones who are not the ones that are lifted up and look to have that feeling of not enough, not good enough, not part of things feeling on the outside. And, and I think the interaction of Jesus provides a lot of hope and healing. Is there any more you want to say about that? I think he's just such a shame lifter. (laughs) You know, when I, when I think about, um, his interactions with women in his context, I think, gosh, that would be so radical, you know, putting myself in their shoes and going, wait, this is shocking that this man, this religious teacher, this rabbi, this, you know, 
wait, what is this? I'm not understanding what's happening, the way that he's treating me. And just how encouraging that would be and hope giving and exciting, right? To then go and share about this man who, you know, has treated me with respect, who has called me out, but in a gentle and loving way and encouraged me. So, yeah. 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 I, um, I know that when I sent you, um, graced originally, you had mentioned that sexual brokenness is not your story. And yet you, I think you still got something out of the Bible study. So maybe, um, I've mentioned that a few times to people like, this is not just a Bible study for women who have experienced sexual brokenness. So if you can talk about how did the Bible study benefit you in some way as a woman who doesn't have a story of sexual brokenness? Yeah. Well, first of all, I am a woman, so I do, I do have that relatability. Um, it, it was, it was so good. I, I think just reading the stories of, of those women and cause we all have a story and mm-hmm. even women with sexual brokenness, all of their stories were different. And I do think there is relatability in all of their stories and in our shared humanity (laughs) as fallen Mm -hmm. people. Um, So yeah, from all of them, I was able to, to pull from and identify with, and I, you know, I do think, um, you know, you said, I, I don't, have a story of sexual brokenness in the ways that these women in the study do, these women in scripture do, which is true. But at the same time, you know, we are, I had a college professor who would always say we are biopsychosocial spiritual beings and, and we're all sexual beings as well. And so I think if we're on this side of the, or yeah, this side of the fall, you know, in, in the now and not yet, I do think that our sexual brokenness is, is just on a spectrum. Mm -hmm. I have women in my family who have experienced sexual brokenness in the ways that these women have. And I've experienced, you know, my own things with sexuality. So, so I think wherever you fall, these women and maybe more importantly, God's grace, like just Jesus meeting us with grace and redemption and restoration is a message for, for any woman and any person. Yeah, I agree. Um, how do you think that women today can relate to and identify with women in scripture? And is that even important? Absolutely. It's important. You know, I I had a friend recently who was doing a, a, a different study. This was before yours came out, Teresa. So I will refer this one to her as well but she was doing a study on women and Jesus and she had grown up in the church her whole life, traditional ministry kid. And she said, you know, I just didn't realize how Jesus treated women. And I think if we were to read the gospels and really sit with them and really look at the stories and sit with the patterns and go, okay, time and time again, Jesus is so good mm-hmm. to women, to everyone. But, you know, I think women feel that in a different way from him. So I think it's important that we see ourselves in the stories of the Bible so that because they had their own, you know, political and economic and governmental things going on and their own sociocultural things going on. And so do we. And so if we can put ourselves in their shoes and and relate to some of the ways that they were ostracized or marginalized and go, okay, this is still very, very true for us today. I think that brings so much hope and encouragement and um, fortification (laughs) for Mm -hmm. us in today's culture to have hope and to find strength in Christ. Is that study that you, your friend was doing, was that called Jesus and Women by Christy McClellan? It was love that she mm-hmm. is an amazing teacher, and mm-hmm. I, I'll put a link to that study in the show notes because if you like Grace, you will love her study, Jesus and Women. I've yeah. I've seen her not in person. I've seen some of her teachings online, and she's she's a really great teacher. 
let's talk a little bit about you as a marriage and family therapist. Um, I'm sure that you've seen sexual brokenness affect marriages and families and individuals. In what ways, um, like what can, what light can you shed for people who have experienced that? And what, what hope do you offer to them? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that goes back to, you know, we are all sexual beings and, and our sexuality touches every part of who we are. And so then when you think about taking each individual's experience and then putting that together in a marriage and trying to figure out how to work that together, and then you add in children and uh, the ways that um, the parents' experiences impact, you know, the next generation and the next generation, definitely sexual brokenness touches all of us in some way. And in my practice, specifically, when I was doing a lot of couples therapy work, I don't, I don't want to make this a generalization across the board, but I will say that in terms of sexual brokenness, what I was seeing more often were men struggling with pornography or some sort of sexual addiction and that impacting their wife and their marital relationship and their intimacy and their levels of trust. And then I would often see on the, on the flip side of that women more often coming in with a history of sexual brokenness or sexual assault or something having Mm -hmm. in their background that is impacting the husband or impacting their relationship, their attachment, their intimacy. Um, And so, yeah, it's, it is, it's a complex thing for couples to work through. It really is. Um, But there are ways to do it. And I, I think a big part of that for, for both people is getting the help that they need also paired with reading stories in scripture. Again, just going back to what sort of grace and hope and redemption does Christ offer us? Okay. And so then how do we find those to come alongside us? And yes, we have this hope in Jesus. Yes, we have him restoring us in so many ways, mind, body, spirit, but then how do we find those that can come alongside us and help us with that holistic healing? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just those other humans who are willing to walk with us through that hard process. Sometimes it's not always, but yeah. yeah. I I loved what you said um, a few minutes ago about your professor who, who called us bio, psycho, social, sexual. Talk a little bit about that because I feel like we compartmentalize. And honestly, I feel like as Christians, we have been really strong on the spiritual nature of our lives, sometimes to the neglect of the physical and the sexual, especially like in the church. It's not something we talk about. It's not something we we want to even, it's like, that's in the box out there. Mm-hmm. And let's let's bring ourselves together as whole people. So can you talk more about just being holistic and how how important that is? Sure, sure. I'll I'll give you an anecdote and I'll I'll keep it anonymous, but I knew someone in my life who was decades older than me and she had walked through a lot of spiritual healing for her past sexual trauma and it was deeply beneficial to her to her family, to her relationships in her later years, to her relationship with the Lord, to her ability to even forgive her abuser, even though he was already gone and passed. And so she really did the spiritual work and was just this spiritual warrior, um, this prayer warrior in her later life and um, just really solid spiritually. And yet while there was some work done in, in, you know, the physical realm, there were still things that hadn't been worked through that could have been worked through with, with a counselor, with a Christian counselor who could help connect what was going on spiritually to, to the mind and body. And so, you know, sometimes we can receive, we can receive hope in the Lord. We can receive his healing. We can 
walk with God and let him transform our hearts um, and do some of that internal healing work. But then we've still got that mind body connection that we've got to kind of bring up to speed mm-hmm. <laughs> if you go with our spiritual formation. And so, you know, a lot of times survivors of sexual trauma will, will have these cues or they'll have these triggers or these associations that, you know, the brain has formed these neural pathways that are connected to things they don't want to be connected with and that they weren't meant to be connected with. And, and so there are ways to heal those things. There are ways to heal and rewire those neural pathways so that, um, the brain is associated with, with things that are, are, more healthy and healing. There are ways to heal the trauma, the PTSD responses, but it it does take an awareness of what is happening in the mind and what is happening in the body. And often if you, if you're working with the, the mental components, you can teach your body to do something different. And so I just, I love it when people have the ability to do all of those things together, when they're seeking out a pastor or a spiritual community or a spiritual mentor director and getting the things that they need in that regard. And then also connecting with a trauma-informed therapist who can help, I will say a Christian trauma-informed therapist who can also work with those mind-body components so that they're experiencing this wholeness and healing all the way around, you know, and because our, our beings, who we are in the flesh also impact our the relationships that are most important to us. And so, you know, I know that doing that work can be hard. I know that we are prone to compartmentalize and to avoid and to not want to go there, but I just want to encourage people to have courage to do it. Um, it's not as scary as you think once you take the first step. And when you trust that you're getting that support from um, wise and trained people who are not going to re-trigger or re-traumatize, they're going to know exactly what you need and walk walk you through that very slowly and safely. And, you know, and also I, I am a marriage and family therapist, so I am thinking of the generational impacts. And so I'm thinking, you know, do it for yourself and also do it for your family and for those generational legacies that you'll leave. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate what you're saying because I, I'll give an anecdote that is not anonymous. (laughs) It's, it's me. Um, I feel like I am that woman that you've talked about where spiritually, I feel like there has been so much healing, so much grace, so much freedom from shame that God has done in my life through studying his word and learning about these people in scripture. But I am honestly just now coming to the point of realizing like, oh, there's a lot of other components to healing. And and I think I have come up through a tradition a tradition that kind of looked down on psychology or anything that wasn't strictly from scripture was like, that's not necessary or, or even sometimes that's harmful. And I have just recently come to realize, no, actually, if it is biblical, it's really good and important and vital for healing I remember going to a um, a chiropractor, oh, like maybe eight years ago, and he did this heart rate variability test on me, and he said, your body is stuck in fight or flight. And I was like, oh, huh, I could have told you that, I know. But I had no idea, like I had no idea whatsoever that that was connected to childhood sexual trauma, like none. Mm -hmm. And then I've, I've mentioned the book, the body keeps the score like a thousand times, but I'm going to mention it again because it is like making connections that I never even knew to make. And I think the church is coming around to the place where they're saying, oh, actually we are physical beings and spiritual and sexual and, and All of these things is who we are. We're not just one thing. And so just the way you were describing that, the importance of 
treating our whole selves. Um, I, I just appreciate that so, yeah. so much. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that, Teresa, because I know that you're not alone. I know that so many people um, have exactly your story. You know, um, we all have different experiences growing up in the church and different traditions. And, you know, I have my own own stuff with that. I, I'm of the age where I kind of grew up in some purity culture and watched a lot of the uh, well-intended messages uh, create more shame or not do the best job. But going back to what you were saying, um, it, that's a, it's a very Gnostic teaching uh, to separate the mind and body. Mm. And that's not the Christian message. You know, when we think about Jesus was born of a woman, came in the flesh, he was both fully human and fully God. There has to be importance in the integration of our humanity and our spirituality. You know, on at church on Sundays, we're taking communion and we're eating of the body and we're drinking of the flesh. Like, her bodies are so important. So I appreciate you sharing that anecdotally and um, Bessel van der Kolk's book as well. The body keeps yes. the score. Yes. Yes. I will link that in the show notes again. Um, do you have advice for couples who are struggling in their marriage because of past sexual trauma? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I first want to say if you are in the beginning of a healing journey with sexual trauma, if you are just getting to the point where you and your your spouse, if you're married, are working through that together, find find a solid church community to be a part of, whether it's a church community or a spiritual community or even just one person that you know um, who shares your faith or shares a similar story who can support you as you begin that healing journey because overcoming sexual trauma it can feel daunting in the beginning and it's just so important to have people that you trust and people that are going to support you to walk alongside you because we weren't meant to walk alone mm. and if you only have a spouse who is supportive great but if you have your spouse and others that is even more beneficial because a couple is really also learning how to to walk through that together and and they are needing support for that as well. So I wanted to say start there. And then I would say if you're on the front end of of working on that mind body piece of healing through sexual trauma, it's really important to start with an individual therapist. So the person who has experienced the sexual trauma, you want to see, I'm very passionate about helping, helping people find the right therapist for mm -hmm. them because that can be very overwhelming. You want to see a licensed mental health counselor or a licensed professional counselor who is a Christian, but who is also trauma informed. So you are going, if you go on psychology today, you're looking for an LPCC or an LMHC who is also trained in EMDR or brain spotting or another trauma-informed modality because they are going to have the tools, again, to help you walk through at your own pace, to not re-trigger or re-traumatize, to know exactly how to help you make those mind-body connections in a way that your body is ready for. Mm. And that's really important because by the time couples come to me for couples counseling, it's important that the person who's gone through um, who, or who's experienced sexual trauma has some awareness of how that in, impacts them. They have some language around what has happened or what they're experiencing in their body now um, and, and has the tools to to self-soothe or to um, emotionally regulate when they are stuck in fight or flight. Because oftentimes what I see is with couples, um, and, and of course, of course, the spouses who are wonderful, um, it, it, there are those, there are those who are very patient and very loving and very understanding and very supportive. 
And then, you know, just depending on the other person's sexual background or formation or religious teachings or what have you, there can be confusion on the spouse's part as to what's happening. And, you know, there could be frustration or impatience or personalization, you know, like, why, why aren't you responding to me? This feels personal. I feel rejected. What's happening that our sexual intimacy isn't where we want it to be. That's hard for me. And so having that individual work first, so that then by the time they get to a licensed marriage and family therapist for help um, with the couple's work and the emotional and sexual intimacy, um, the, the person who's experienced sexual trauma has the ability to, to go through that with their spouse as they're learning, um, as I'm giving some psychoeducation and teaching them, you know, have patience. Here's actually what's happening. Here's how to approach this. We need to really take baby steps toward intimacy because again, the, you know, um, sexual trauma has such an impact on the whole person and a person's ability to connect and to attach. And so you've got to, you've got to take it slow or you might need to approach it indirectly when you're working toward intimacy of any sort. So yeah, just hope, hopefully giving the listeners a few tips and thoughts of where they might begin and what that process kind of looks like. That is so helpful. I think about the fact that I, I appreciate you giving the specifics. You know, you're looking for a person with these letters um, because if you are struggling with, you know, cancer, you go to a, an oncologist. Right. If you're struggling with heart disease, you go to a cardiologist. Like there are specialties for things that we struggle with physically. And I think just you mentioning like these are specialties these are these are people that have the tools to help you they have they have the knowledge they have the things that you need as opposed to go see a counselor you know, it's it's really right. important that you go to the right counselor and i appreciate that and and it's really i think it's hard to find that right person so if okay. you have any suggestions on how to find or do you have a list of people that you recommend in other states that you could share with our listeners? I don't. I have been, that is something that's been on my radar for years. I wish I did. <laughs> if you go to psychologytoday.com, you can search for therapists in your area and you can also select for EMDR, LPC. You can select for different things mm -hmm. that I've mentioned. So that's helpful. If you go to marriagefriendlytherapist.com, that's another good list of resources. I'm trying to think. If you if you Google, I'm not sure of the website link, but if you Google emotionally focused couples therapist, you can find because that's an evidence-based attachment focused mm. couple modality. So that's EFT, emotionally focused therapy. You can find another list of people who are who are trained there that would be very helpful for a couple working through the impact of sexual trauma. I will, I will put links to that in the show notes, but right. also then I would also recommend that if, when you find that list, you go onto those people's websites and you see what they believe and you see if they're, if they're coming, I think a lot of them will say that they're a Christian practice or that they're, that they are, um, what do you call it? biblically informed, you know, that, that it's not just find somebody who can do this modality. It's finding the right person who can do that. But I think that's a yes. step, you know, that's step one, get a list. Mm -hmm. Step two, go through your list, look at their websites, do, do a, what do you call those pre-calls? What do you call that? When you call somebody and do like an evaluation or something for free just to see a free consultation. Okay. Yes. A consultation. Thank you. So it's not just them consulting you, you're consulting them too. And I think yes. that's, that is a really important thing is to find the right fit. So yes, I, yes. I just appreciate what you've said. Um, I want to just pivot real quick. Cause I want to talk a little bit about grace and just your thoughts for, um, women who you think would benefit from, from going through that study? Well, I think 
if you are a woman who has been sinned against, I think he, if you are a woman who has sinned, I think <laughs> if you are a woman, <laughs> what I'm getting at is I think any woman would benefit from this study. Teresa, you had mentioned you had sent me one of your chapters early on to edit, and I have my own story where I have felt marginalized in different ways or just or even just you know self-conscious about the way that my life looks compared to others or you know these messages that that haven't gotten directly um shared with me but that I feel having grown up in the church and just knowing like what's subtly valued even mm -hmm. even when we aren't aware of that and um so yeah, I just I really think any woman could benefit from this study. Actually, I'll tell you this, I had ordered your study and was doing it out in public somewhere. And a girl came up to me. She's like, can you just tell me what study that is? It looks really good. Uh -huh. so I don't know if it was the cover or if she saw, you know, some of what I was reading, but I just really think that any woman could benefit from this. Oh, well, thank you. That's, I hope so. That's the goal. That's the prayer is, and it's God's word. So I kind of feel like you can't go wrong. If you're studying God's word, he will, he will use it in your life. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about that I might have missed? I think, I think maybe the only thing I, I want to hit on is, you know, over the past few years, I've become pretty passionate about people knowing that there are safe church spaces. Teresa, I'm sure that you and your husband's church are one of those. I, I can tell just by listening to your podcast and the way that you speak. Um, but, you know, I, so many people have given up on the church and mm -hmm. giving up, given up on Christian community. And I just want to encourage you that, you know, if you are someone who has felt marginalized in some way and it had, that's made it hard to go to church or to participate, to check in with yourself. You know, we, we all have, those of us who are Christians have the Holy Spirit living inside of us and, and we can use our discernment. Is this a safe place or not? And I just want to encourage you to find hope where you can find it and to find those safe and supportive places who will uplift you and support you and give you healthy, healthy messages and not, um, put that shame back on, but encourage you in the freedom that you have in Christ. Mm. Yeah, I I love that. I think that's so important. And um I really appreciate our church. They are actually letting me teach through Grace in a class on Sunday mornings. And that's what amazing. I have seen is um just this beautiful community forming of women who feel like oh, I'm not alone. And, and it's just been so freeing to me and, and to watch them blossom and come out and be able to share stories that maybe they've never shared before. Mm -hmm. And so if your church, maybe you're saying your church isn't an unsafe place, but honestly, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm a commercial because I'm, I'm not like buy my book, but honestly, I feel like you could start a group in your church and create that safe space for women. You can be the one who says, you know what, let's do this. Let's gather a group of women and let's talk about these things that are hard to talk about and that are extremely personal, but they need to come out and they need to come out in a safe way. Then you be the person to create that safe space for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And change that culture. That's great. I always, at the end of my podcast, ask my list, um, ask my guests if they have books that they would like to recommend, um, because I love to read books. I love to write little book reviews in my newsletter each month. So, do you have any book recommendations that you would give to our listeners? Sure. Well, that is hard because there are so many that I could give, but mm -hmm. I will stay in the vein that we've been talking about. So. Uh, one would be Try Softer by Andy Kolber. She is an LPC. She is trauma-informed, EMDR trained, and she, she writes from a Christian perspective. She's integrating faith and mental health to talk about 
how to reduce stress, anxiety, symptoms from trauma, and how to live, how to live more free. So that's a great one. Uh, I think she has a new book, Strong Like Water, but her stuff is really good. Um, she Deserves Better. The subtitle to that one is Raising Girls to Resist Toxic Teachings on Sex, Self, and Speaking Up. So yes. that, is, <laughs> that is by Sheila Ray Gregoire. And that is based on a survey she had done with, I think it was 20,000 plus mm -hmm. evangelical women and toxic teachings that they had gotten. And so this book is for the next generation. It's how do mothers talk with their daughters to make sure that they are getting healthier messages around sexuality and knowing what's okay, what's not okay, learning how to speak up. So that's a really great resource. And then Good and Beautiful and Kind is my last recommendation. That is by Rich Velotis. He also has a book called The Deeply Formed Life, but his is just a really great integration of mind, body, soul. Um, it's kind of in the Christian formation, spiritual formation realm, but he writes in a holistic way. I'm excited because I have read Try Softer and She Deserves Better, but I haven't read Good and Beautiful and Kind. So I'm going to put that on my read list. I'm excited about that. Um, and tell us, tell us where to find your writing, because as I mentioned, you are writing a memoir and um, I want to, well, you tell us about it and then I'll put my two cents in. <laughs> okay. Um, you can find my memoir. I'm 10 chapters in. I'm publishing in real time. You can find that at kinsey.substack.com. And then you can also find the majority of my other work at bravemarriage.com. So that's where I have my private practice, my online private practice, where I do premarital coaching. I've, I have a program that I've in curriculum that I've written called Wedwell. So that's really fun. Mm. If anyone listening has family members, um, check that out. I have, and then I do couples counseling and individual coaching, but still from a relationship orientation. So, and then the Brave Marriage podcast is linked there as well. Yes, yes, yes. All the things. I, I want everybody to listen to the podcast and get on your sub stack. Um, guys, I don't subscribe to very many things, but I am subscribed to Kenzie's um, sub stack because I love her writing. I have found myself in her story, even though our stories are so different. It's like you read the way she writes and the things that she covers I feel like I'm finding myself and it's just, it's beautiful. You're a beautiful writer. I love, I think this summer you've put out a few poems on your sub stack and those have been really beautiful. So um, I'm just excited to introduce people to you if they haven't heard you yet. I'm excited to put all the links and I just appreciate you being here. So thank you so much, Kenzie, for, for being our guest today. Of course, you're welcome. Thank you so much. This study is so good. I'm so glad you wrote it. I'm so glad you had a heart for it and went for it. Um, yeah, I hope everyone gets graced. And yeah, Teresa, thank you so much for your work. Thanks for hanging out with me today on Find Hope Here. To find anything I mentioned on the episode, go to TeresaWhiting.com slash listen. That's where you can find all the show notes. And remember to hit that subscribe button. If you want to go the extra mile and leave a review, that would be amazing. And it would mean so much to me. I'd like to leave you with this prayer from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope.